You're listening to a Burnt Toast production. The Terrible Business of Salmon and Dusk. Book One, How to Disappear Completely. Written and performed by Mike Barber. Episode 9 Ahead, Theo can see the glass towers of the city. Nero turns a corner and the towers are on the right. Another corner, and Theo can see them in the rear view. This isn't possible, but she doesn't argue. Tonight, Theo is only going to start arguments she can win. The tiredness makes the strange easy and the easy strange. She feels stripped to nerve and tendon crashing from one emotion to the next as erratically as Nero crosses London. There had been hope for a moment, seeing Josh's face in the streetlight. After that, horror, loss, envy, and bewilderment without any particular narrative to bind them. Breathe on her, and she might crumble to tears. Or break somebody's nose. Anything feels possible. Any decision might go eight ways wrong. Kilby passes her a cigarette without asking, and she wonders why. He seems the sort of boy who does nothing without a reason. This is business. She tries to remember he has designs on her future. Too late, she realises that his sympathy, his hesitance, is an act. He makes her demand she gives him what he already wants. She suspects his explanations, his nonsense, his easy admissions of time travel and worse, are to distract her from questions she doesn't know yet to ask. Nero breaks hard. There Josh is, crossing the road in front of them. Theo almost doesn't recognise him. The expression is distant, focused on something she can't see. His shoulders are hunched in, his head lowered. This is a man with somewhere to be. That isn't Josh at all. How many secrets has he been keeping from her? And why? She reaches for her phone to check the time. She remembers... It's in Kilby's coat, so at more or less the same time he does. He winks. She doesn't. Kilby leans forward in his seat. Nero, matey, uh, you'd better go set this up. Oh, he looks down at the tabby batting at his tie. About those cats. I ain't doing the cats. I got allergies. They were a bold experiment on reflection. Not worth the effort. Best you reunite them with their loved ones. You're going mutton. I said no way to the Moggies. Kilby beams, puts out his hand. Well, it suits me. Give me the car keys. You stay with Jones. There is a beat. Nero lets his forehead ricochet off the steering wheel. Taking his hand back, Kilby pulls a pocketbook from his coat, tears out a page, and tosses it onto the front seat. Names, addresses, phone numbers. I've made a note of the rewards offered. Don't let them fob you off with tea and biscuits. Not this time. He opens his door a crack. Oh, and don't get the cats mixed up. It's not a good look. Like I would. Again. At the curb, Theo watches the cab drive off. She blinks and can't find it again. She directs Kilby towards Josh's office and ends up following him. You kidnap cats for the reward money. Jones, that's a gross mischaracterization of our efforts. I prefer to call it feline rescue. We found those cats. You found 23 lost cats. In this case, we simply found them before they got lost. How is that not kidnapping, catnapping, whatever? Well, a simple cause and effect. Anyone can steal a cat. It takes proper skill to steal a cat that has already been stolen. Those posters on the dash. You collected them. Right. Before you stole the cats. Now you get it. That's the business model. That way... We don't change anything. History stays intact. The observed events still look the same. A cat disappears and reappears. We're basically performing a community service. You kidnap cats you know are going to go missing and claim the reward. (sighs) You have a way of phrasing things, Jones, that reflects very poorly upon me. Like that painting, that was the same thing. You steal things that you know have been stolen, are going to be stolen. 
and nobody is any the wiser. Sometimes we sell them on to the intended thief at a reasonable markup, other times to the highest bidder. If there's enough wriggle room, we'll retrieve the item for the original owner, provided they keep it under wraps. Theo no longer wonders why Kilpi is telling her this. The answer is clear. He's showing off. You're so smug, she says. I'm an entrepreneur. I thought you were a detective. As I said, depends on the pay scale. Rain thickens the cold as they reach the embankment, the drizzle not falling so much as loitering. Theo turns up her hood, and Kilby flips the collar of his coat and pulls on a deerstalker hat. A nagging sense of familiarity, a sort of distant déjà vu, suddenly becomes clear. I've seen you in Nero before. On my first night in London, Islington, you were stealing the heads of parking meters. That has the cigarette, as yet unlit, dip from Kilby's bottom lip. Were we? With a cricket bat? He laughs. <laughs> That's actually quite a good idea. When was this? About six months ago? You don't remember? Six months? Not impossible. If it's happened. He pulls his pocketbook from his coat and makes a few quick notes. Islington? Six months? Question mark. Parking meters. You were wearing that stupid hat. Theo adds. For a moment, Kilby looks wounded, but it is another minute before he removes the hat and shoves it back into the same pocket as the notebook. It is late. The tourists are asleep, but the streets are not. Night buses glide, taxis circle. A drunk stops halfway across the bridge and turns back to take in the view. A lonely moment of clarity. You are here. Theo thinks, all these lives have already happened. The thought makes her feel fragile in ways she doesn't quite understand. The future is dark and inevitable. There are hearts beating now that today have stopped or been broken. Now that drunk is invincible, today he is already hung over. Theo wonders what would happen if she stepped in his way, in anyone's way. She has nothing to tell them other than, tomorrow is coming, be mindful, do something different. She feels that old urge to jump, to smash something. But she says nothing. These lives move on in invisible ruts while she and Kilby linger at a bus stop. Josh pushes on in a rut of his own. They know where he is going. It's only arriving at Josh's office that Theo thinks about getting in the door. Big Ben gives the time at ten past five. Kilby catches her looking and tuts. Even the cleaners will have gone home now. Kilby reaches into his coat and produces what seems to be a pocket calculator. Numerous wires and cables are sprung into and out of it, connecting a small phone battery which is duct-taped to the back. What's that? A knocker. Useful for being in places we shouldn't. Except... He abandons that sentence, and Theo sees that the glass doors of the foyer are already ajar, the locking mechanism clicking and unwinding indecisively. The security pad by the entrance flashes with green panic. The LCD readout blinks. Twelve o'clock. Twelve o'clock. Twelve o'clock. The CCTV cameras spasm and whir. Kilby notes all of this, with neither surprise nor interest, pocketing his device and standing back from the door like he's just remembered he's a gentleman. Or a coward. Theo hesitates. You said he disappeared. So... Whatever happened to him, happens to him, it happens here. Change your mind. No. I don't know. I feel like I'm not supposed to know this. It feels kind of pervy, like reading his diary. Would you read his diary? The envelope in Josh's sock drawer. Sure, but I'll probably regret it. A smile flickers, but Kilby is searching her for something. You're worried. You think he did kill his boss. Theo feels a pang of guilt. Her worries were smaller than that. An affair, a betrayal, even more mundane reasons why he left her. Running from a murder would almost be a relief, nothing to do with her. She is starting to realise how keenly she has cultivated ignorance. Maybe it is better not to know anything for certain. Tell me he didn't, she says. Kilby smiles, slipping through the open door and seeming certain Theo will follow. It annoys her to prove him right. 
Dumped in the centre of the foyer's sterile marble floor is a tangle of coils and wires. Little bigger than a car battery, it looks like the electrical equivalent of a hairball, coughed there by some sickly robot. Fearing an explosive, Theo checks her paranoia. She has stood on this marble in a few hours' time. There were no scorch marks. Kilby stands back, arms folded. I wouldn't get too close. That looks seriously dirty. What is it? Same as the thing in my pocket, just three times bigger. It pumps out a little pocket of surplus time to confuse anything keeping count. Uh, computers, clocks, security systems. Like a, a noise cancellor. It projects an alternative present where the exact opposite of what is happening is happening, with the net result being very confusing for anything that isn't human. It's actually quite impressive. Nero would love it. He pulls a pen and notebook from another pocket and makes a quick but competent sketch. Anyway, it's good news. Is it? Oh, yeah. I can't see your boyfriend building something like that. Can you? We didn't speak to each other for two days after the last time we went to Ikea. Kilby laughs, starts, and winces. His hand goes to his side and comes away wet. Is that blood? Theo says. Pulling up his shirt, Kilby reveals a perfect line of blood across the lower right of his abdomen, pointing to his belt buckle. He wipes the blood clear with his right palm. The skin beneath is intact. I thought you'd been hurt, Theo says. Mm, time leakage. A side effect of that thing. Events are getting muddled. But it's not fantastic news. There's the file of something glowing gold at the heart of it. Little wisps of phosphorescent gas twitch and boil away from the glass. What is that? Time. Pure time. I thought you said time was just events. Oh, gravity's just Newtons, but it can still break your leg. Kilby frowns again at the blood on his hand. Ambient tech. Interesting. Looks like Nero's got competition. Competition? He's the expert. From upstairs, someone screams. Theo hardly recognises it as Josh. She leaps the barricade and is halfway up the stairs before Kilby catches her. His hand is firm on her elbow. Let's not make a mess. That was Josh! You're not supposed to be here, remember? I have to save him? <laughs> no, 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 no! <laughs> uh, that's not the job. Something dawns, dark and dirty over Theo. The exact nature of Kilby's detective work. Watching crimes that have already happened. You thought I would just stand by and let whatever happened to him happen again. I thought we were both clear on that. Kilby blows out his cheeks. Honestly, you would not believe how often this happens. This is sadistic. Oh, so many words for professional. Look, Jones, I said I'd show you where he went if we find him. Save him. It has to be in the future. Them's the rules. Whose rules? For what it's worth, I don't think your boyfriend gets hurt. To be honest, I don't think he's even here. What are you talking about? I saw him. We both saw him. We followed him here. That's what we're doing, isn't it? Not really, but I do have a certain professional curiosity. Theo relaxes, waits for Kilby to lift his hand, and bolts down the corridor. She knows where she's going. Straight into the office she saw sealed this morning. She thinks she knows what she is expecting. She is wrong. Josh's boss is lying dead on the floor, in a sticky glacier of blood. The blood is almost comically red, the carpet spreading melanoma or a bleak kind of deja vu. His mouth is slack and ridiculous, his eyes pastel like boiled sweets. Josh is by the far wall, in front of a compact, open safe. The safe is filled with folders of important documents. In this tableau Theo has created just by walking through the door, Josh is shoved up against the wall by a stranger. Another stranger stands before him. The wall safe is open. In Josh's hand is a box about as hefty as a leather-bound Bible and locked with a belt. His gaze slides in slow motion towards Theo. Between him and her, are the two strangers, a man and a woman. Both are tall, both have bald heads like tanned legs of ham, and both are such a poor fit for this office that Theo at first doubts she has truly seen them. They are wearing loose-fitting tunics of hessian and leather, their legs bandaged with yellowing cloth. 
the sartorial effect is that of Vikings costumed on a charity shop budget. Around their waists, butcher's belts string a selection of brutal knives, cutters and choppers. Neither of them is wearing shoes that match. On one foot, a black trainer, on the other, a brown brogue. More than that, the feet don't appear to match, nor the legs, the exposed shins of which reveal variegation and an improbable disparity in musculature. The man appears to have two left hands, one of which, that gripping Josh by the throat, has been inverted on his right wrist. His torso is vast, swaddled in heavy rolls of alabaster flesh, far too much flesh for either of the legs propping it up. Lean and wiry, the woman is better assembled. Her limbs display an approximate symmetry, with two long Titian dreadlocks rudely stitched into the taut scalp atop her long, scarred face. In her left hand is a long, polished blade, which she has pressed to the softest part of Josh's chin. These are people who don't make sense. Theo realises that her recognising their existence has changed something in her. Her life, such as it is, looks different, dirtier, meaner. Josh! The name escapes her on instinct, like she's trying to call him back from this new world, back to her, back to the cosy dissatisfactions of domestic life. The strangers turn to see her. Their blank faces are coarse with scars and fresh stitches. The room shakes. No, the room stays still. The world shakes. The world that isn't bricks and mortar, tree or earth. A shockwave runs through Theo like she's a struck gong, but no papers scatter on the nearby desk. The frames don't rattle against the whitewashed walls. Only Theo rocks. She and Josh and Kilby and the wrong man and woman. The latter staggers backwards as if drunk. Her weapon drops. Josh seizes the moment to bolt. He has passed Theo before she registers, out the door and taking the wooden box with him. The world settles and stills. Kilby is beside Theo, offering a hand to help her up. I told you not to shout, he says. Theo ignores him, pushes him aside, and runs after Josh. She misses him on the stairs down, but finds him waiting in the foyer, halfway out the door. There is something dangerous about the way he is standing, halfway in, halfway out. There is an expression on his face she has never seen before. One part terror, two parts exhilaration. It stops her at the security gate. I'm sorry, Theo, he says. It's okay, she says, hoping to be honest. There's a guy upstairs. He can help, I think. He's already helped. Listen, Theo, you weren't supposed to know about any of this. I I'm not sure what I know. Only needed another 24 hours. You would have had him back and been none the wiser. Had who back? Me. Him. Here. Take him home. Josh tugs a glass jar from his coat pocket. It's little bigger than a jam jar, with a rubber seal and a sprung latch. Inside, dust glitters. With his right hand, Josh holds the jar out, as far away from himself as he can manage, and flips the lid open. The seal pops and there is a terrific sucking noise, like the last moments of a draining bath. The dust in the jar ignites with a fierce glow. Something comes loose from Josh. A smeared impression of him, a shadow of golden light that coalesces and fizzes into the same gas Theo saw dance around the device on the tiles. With professional grace, this phosphorescence wraps itself up and pours into the waiting jar. The instant this is done, Josh seals the jar and throws it to Theo, who is almost too startled to catch it. The glass is warm in her hand. Kilby is beside her, breathless and frowning. That's not your boyfriend, he says. Theo looks to the young man by the door. For half a second, she thinks she knows him, almost waves in greeting. Thirty seconds ago, she thought he was Josh, but she no longer recognises the way his black hair is pulled left across his thin face. Now, he is a stranger. Josh has gone. Theo blinks. There is cold water in her gut. What the hell just happened? Where's Josh? The question seems to surprise Kilby. His answer is slow and obvious. He's in the jar? The man that isn't Josh grins and runs. Runs straight into another of the butchers, short, stocky, with an eruption of dark hair in the very centre of his scalp. The effect, at a glimpse, is that of a distant, toxic fire. 
Not Josh runs into him with the force of a cyclist hitting a car door. He bounces backwards with almost comic violence, sprawling on the floor. The box crashes down beside him and skates towards Kilby's boots. Kilby picks it up, almost accidentally, as if it was always meant to be his. There is a crash from behind Theo. The larger of the two butchers from upstairs has come through the security gate without bothering to open it. The wreckage sparks and fizzes. Even in her panic, this troubles Theo. The gate was still intact come the morning, wasn't it? No. She remembers it differently now. Police tape, forensics, and technicians vaulting a man hunched over a toolbox. Shoving the box into his right armpit, Kilby turns to face the butcher, palms up. <laughs> uh, hang on now. Uh, no need to make it personal. Whatever I wasn't supposed to see most definitely went unseen. 100% off the books. He mimes zipped lips. The woman grunts an instruction, and her partner swaggers forward with terrifying purpose. His ill-matched hands reach for the tools at his belt. Trying to look anywhere else, Theo notices the man is wearing one shoe with spats. There is a ragged and bloody line embroidered with wire above the ankle. A heavy hessian bag, stained black, is slung over his shoulder. Theo knows, with startling certainty, that he intends to kill her. Kilby is backing away, keeping his hands where everyone can see them. His smile is flimsy and desperate. I I'm just warning you now, I'm not as healthy as I look. Damaged stock. Not really worth your time. He thumps his chest and coughs twice, <laughs> aiming for the rheumatic. The butcher keeps coming. Oh, are you after this? Kilby makes a show out of just noticing the box in his armpit. You should have said. He holds the box out. Something whistles through the air and the approaching butcher stops in his tracks. An arrow has embedded itself in his right shoulder with a wet thud. The butcher frowns at it with a kind of irritation an ordinary man would give a fresh coffee stain on a clean shirt. Theo turns. In the open door, beside the man who isn't quite Josh, is a woman she doesn't quite know. Short, blonde hair spiked, nose ring, tattoos on her bare arms. The receptionist. Theo blinks, and the woman is gone. Not Josh is gone too. The butcher snaps the arrow and tosses the feathered half aside. Kilby seizes the moment's distraction and shoves the box into a poacher's pocket on the inside of his coat. To Theo, he says, Run! You've been listening to The Terrible Business of Salmon and Dusk. Book 1, How to Disappear Completely. Written and performed by Mike Bartlett. If you'd like to find out more about this podcast, check out salmonandusk.com. You've been listening to a Burnt Toast production.